Okay, hello everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Florian Shikursi. Many of you already know him, and, but I'm going to introduce him, give a brief introduction to him anyway. So Florian is an assistant professor of computer science at University of Toronto and director of Robot Vision and Learning Lab. Uh, he's a faculty member at the University of Toronto Robotics Institute, a faculty affiliate of the Vector Institute itself, and a uh, this tall fellow of the NSER Canadian Robotics Network. So Florian got his PhD from McGill University and I believe he did his undergrad at U of T actually. Uh, so his research spans uh, many areas, including autonomous robotics, machine learning, uh, control and computer vision. And the main problems that he's working on are decision-making and control under, under, under uncertainty, imitation learning, 3D perception, visual exploration, and search and safe learning. Uh, so he's a recipient of many awards, including Alexander Graham Bell Doctoral Award and AAAI Robotics Fellowship. And today, Florian is going to talk about robots in the wild from task specification to safety during and after learning. Please join me in welcoming Florian. Thanks very much, Amir Masood. Um, so hi, everyone. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Florian Shkruti. I'm an assistant professor in CS uh, at U of T, where I direct the Robot Vision and Learning Lab. Uh, and I'm also a faculty affiliate at the Vector Institute. And I wanted to talk about um, issues that arise when robots that use learned, learned components or learn in the wild, uh, uh, what type of issues they face from uh, task specification to safety during and after learning. So that's uh, what the main subject of the uh, talk is going to be today. Um, so today's plan is uh, to give you a, a brief overview of my lab's research agenda and give you highlights from three representative projects. Um, so the first one is uh, task specification for visual search and exploration. Um, the second part is, uh, is about how do we get safety guarantees for exploration in RL. And the third part is how do we uh, increase safety um, after learning uh, by automatically generating adversari adversarial scenarios in, in simulation. And I'm going to talk about future directions uh, throughout these three uh, parts, but also at the end. And you should feel free to ask questions or interrupt at any point during the talk uh, so that we can uh, discuss. So let's start with the prologue and uh, give you a brief int introduction. So uh, as Amir Masood mentioned, I'm Part of the, I'm a faculty member at the U of T Robotics Institute, which is an umbrella organization for all robotics activities at U of T across departments, in compu from computer science to aerospace engineering to mechanical engineering, uh, and surrounded by uh, extremely uh, good colleagues, as you can see. Um, here is our presence in the very beginning, a few months after the institute was founded back uh, in ICRA, uh, which is one of the main conferences in, ro in, ro in robotics in 2019, which is like 20 years ago. Uh, and later that fall, um, the same uh, group of people and even more uh, students who joined us that fall. Um, at, this is a picture of them from, uh, from a workshop that we did uh, at U of T. So it's a really good time to be a roboticist at, at U of T, but it's always a good time to be a roboticist. That said, uh, full autonomy is still out of reach and uh, it's worth asking why. And my, my opinion is that uh, it's, it's still out of reach because we have a few, um, uh, a few, there, there are a few dichotomies, a few problems that, uh, you know, we haven't managed how to uh, how to solve in a satisfactory way. So, for example, we have really good robots uh, on other planets uh, that have extremely uh, useful sensors uh, for doing science uh, missions, and yet we remote control these robots because because we do not trust them enough to do science on their own and make decisions autonomously because the stakes are too high. And if anything happens, um, you know. Uh, we do not want to go to make all this effort of sending these robots there uh, go to waste. We also have uh, self-driving cars, and yet we do not know how to certify them. Um, so we sort of gain confidence about how, these, how well these systems work just by uh, testing them in the real world uh, more and more and by uh, testing them in simulation more and more, but we do not know what type of 
uh, environments to show uh, these the systems in order to train them better. Uh, and we do not know what types of guarantees we, we can give uh, in order to certify these cars when they go on the road, just like you would certify uh, planes, for example. Uh, we also have very impressive um, you know, robotic systems that are way beyond what any uh, roboticist would imagine 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, and yet we do not have a good way of marrying you know, tra uh, traditional control theory and what the structures that we know from traditional robotics with learning base uh, approaches. And finally, we have a simulation which is becoming uh, more and more realistic and resembling the, uh, the real world and slowly, very slowly uh, closing the simulation to reality gap. Uh, but we do not know what, what type of environments to simulate and why. So the high level questions that guide my research uh, are the following. Um, so how can non-expert users specify robot behavior without writing any code? Um, how can we provide safety guarantees for these learned behaviors? And how can simulation help in particular? Uh, and also how can robot decision-making and control improve with, uh, with experience? And when I say decision-making and control, I also refer to reinforcement learning. I just uh, want to make it as generic as possible. So the areas that are represented in my lab in order to address these questions are first and foremost robotics and then uh, machine learning perception and decision making and control in service of uh, robotics. So more concretely, my research agenda addresses some of the following issues. So the first one uh, has to do with uh, autonomous robots for scientific data collection. Uh, and the central question here is that of visual attention. Uh, search and exploration. So the question here is where should robots look and why? The second direction has to do with uh, how to best marry machine learning with uh, planning and control from traditional robotics. Uh, and uh, some of the issues we're looking at here are continual learning, uh, learning to plan and uh, control system identification, and what are the best representations for from vision in order to uh, serve control the best uh, and also issues of imitation learning and inverse RL. And uh, finally, um, we are looking into uh, how to get safety guarantees, uh, especially via better simulation. So in this direction, we're looking into differentiable simulators, how to generate adversarial scenarios in simulation how to improve these simulators with data from the real world and how to do safe exploration in reinforcement learning. So today I'm gonna to be talking about mostly uh, directions one and three. So let's start with one, uh, which addresses task specification and in particular, where should robots look? How can they autonomously record useful data for scientists and how do we communicate what's, what, what does it mean for data to be useful to, uh, to a robot? So some background here. So mobile robots are widely used to autonomously monitor uh, and collect data in these unstructured natural environments from uh, under the sea to the surface of the water uh, to farms and fields and even on other planets. Uh, and scientists are really uh, eager to use some of these devices and uh, machines in order to collect data, but uh, robots are just a means to an end to them. They're more interested in the data than the actual uh, robotics uh, deployment. So how can we ensure that the data that these robots collect is relevant and useful for these uh, scientists who deploy them in the field? And in particular for environmental scientists who, who are not expert roboticists, how can we make it easy for them to specify uh, what type of data the robots should collect? So in particular, if you have, let's say, an underwater robot, which is super expensive and really difficult to deploy, um, where should it focus its camera when it's navigating in 3D? We might as well ask a biologist, uh, and she's going to tell us that she's probably interested in um, you know, footage of coral reefs. So if you ask her, she might tell you that the robot should focus probably on that coral head number one and then coral head number two, uh, and that's that's an interesting uh, type of feedback from from, bi from biologists, but we're not actually interested in that feedback. We're more interested in the reward function that she has and the decision making process, process that she has in order to select these two uh, sites. 
So we want the robot to behave like the scientist doing experiment design and data analysis in the field uh, so that it can collect the same type of data that the scientist would, uh, would collect. And this, if you think about it, uh, this will resemble more and more, uh, you know, issues of the trade-off of exploitation and exploration in reinforcement learning. Uh, and you might want to balance what the scientist wants uh, with also detecting perhaps surprising observations. So if you see a turtle, but the scientist hasn't told you anything about turtles, you should probably still want to record um, uh, the turtle just because it occurs so infrequently in the uh, in the visual stream. Uh, and uh, Greg, Greg Durek and uh, one of his uh, PhD students, Yogesh Girdar, uh, worked on this for many years, uh, how to detect surprise in video streams uh, and how to make robots navigate based on surprise. Um, and they had some really, really nice results, which are uh, which I definitely encourage you to look at. Uh, but the issue here remains that doing active sensing and information gathering behaviors does not necessarily lead to scientifically useful observations. So another way to say this is everything is surprising in the real world. So if you navigate with surprise being your criterion, uh, you're going to find everything surprising uh, just by changing the viewpoint, changing the lighting conditions, just visiting a new place. So we need, we cannot do surprise at the pixel level. Uh, we need to do, uh, we either need to reason about surprise based on uh, objects, uh, or we need to, uh, we need to essentially think about surprise based on um, different quantities that our dynamics models can predict, uh, as opposed to just predicting uh, pixels. So in our case, we're actually going to ignore the exploration problem for a bit, and we're going to just focus on exploitation uh, and visual search because that's that's also under um, uh, under appreciated and uh, not looked at carefully enough. So the first version of visual search uh, that you might think about is to actually ask the scientist for what waypoints the the robot should should visit. And this is fine, but you're placing all the onus of decision making to the scientist, hoping that if the robot visits all those waypoints, uh, it will actually collect useful data. Uh, so this is not exactly what we want to do. Version two is uh, have the scientist annotate many images. So have the scientist provide uh, semantic segmentation of all the um, all underwater images, for example, and tell you what's interesting and what's what's not, uh, and then have the robot evaluate, use that model while uh, selecting where to look at. Uh, and this is very label intensive, so we don't want to do this either. The third version, which uh, I actually like and we have um, we have focused on, uh, and I'm going to describe uh, in this uh, in this talk, is. Um, Enabling the scientist to show a single uh, a single image exemplar and tell the robot, uh, here robot, try to find uh, you know visual content that looks like this. So there is visual similarity that needs to be uh, computed. Uh, so this sort of implicitly specifies a reward function over over images. So here's how this works. If you have an input image, which is the main camera that the robot is looking at, uh, and you assume that the scientist has given um, exemplar images to, to the robot, you, you might have uh, images like this. Uh, so you want to say that the scientist is interested in uh, brain corals of uh, particular or corals of particular kind. Uh, and you might want to tell the robot that it should also be interested in divers. But notice that none of these two exemplars actually appear in the uh, in the image. So it's not template matching. And you're not looking for the same diver here. And in fact, the exemplar of the diver that you have is from a completely other viewpoint than what uh, this particular diver appears in this image. And yet the heat map of similarity here detected the diver uh, here and the uh, brain coral uh, here. So you want to be able to modify the behavior of the robot just by showing a few examples and uh, uh, assume that the robot can reason about visual similarity. So what does it mean to reason about visual similarity and at what level? 
So we start by, uh, we actually treat this as a contrastive learning problem over videos. So we assume that we have, um, um, we have many videos of underwater environments and we use typical key point matching and patch ex extraction uh, pipelines that people have been using for a long time in, uh, uh, in computer vision. And we assume that if you can see the same area over, uh, if you can track the same uh, point over a large number of uh, frames, you will eventually see it from a vastly uh, different viewpoint as long as the robot is moving. So it, the fact that you have been able to track it imposes a local similarity constraint and imposes the uh, imposes the constraint that this uh, the embedding of this view should be the same as the embedding of this view because it's they're referring to the same object. So the desired scenario here is that you have these long patch sequences with viewpoint variations, uh, and yet you want the, you want to leave the embedding of these uh, views invariant to these viewpoints. So what we do in order to achieve this uh, is, as I mentioned, contrastive representation learning uh, with some help from uh, from humans. So we start by uh, we start by clustering. We start by passing all these uh, patches from, uh, in, into a um, into an encoder that is pre-trained on ImageNet, and that gives us an initial hierarchical clustering of the um, of, of these uh, of, of these uh, patches and all these uh, uh, patch sequences. We ask the user to shuffle uh, or correct these uh, clusters at the high level, and that gives us uh, groupings of uh, of key point uh, patches that are, of key point sequences that are uh, similar. So at this point, we assume that the uh, clusters are more or less uh, fixed without a lot of annotation. So the user here is not interfering at the pixel level. The user is interfering only at the hierarchical uh, clustering level. Once we have these clusters, we we want to uh, we want to embed uh, we want to modify this encoder here so that it uh, embeds uh, similar uh, patches together and pushes di uh, different patches apart in embedding space. So we can do this uh, through uh, triplet losses or other contrastive uh, type of losses. And once we do this, we have an encoder that can be used uh, during deployment or testing by evaluating the embedding of an exemplar and trying to find that, uh, uh, trying to compute uh, the convolutions of that embedding with the embedding of a full input image. And that's how it computes the, the heat map. So once you have a model like this that can compute a heat map over what's uh, what's salient or relevant according to what the um, the scientists said, uh, you can actually um, you can actually deploy it uh, on the real robot. So um, first of all, we evaluated this on on static data sets and showed that this type of weak supervision does better than other types of uh, weak supervision. Uh, but we also uh, tested it in, in the field where we have a robot such as this one, which has two cameras, uh, one at the front here and one looking downward at the back, which is used for videography. And we want this downward camera here to be uh, looking at interesting things. And we want the forward camera to be looking at the diver in order to help it navigate. Um, so here you will see the tracking camera and here you will see the, the saliency uh, view. So here's how this looks in practice. So you have a robot that uh, is tracking the diver uh, and it computes the salient map, uh, which uh, indicates that the, the things on the, on the right uh, are more interesting than the things on the, on the bottom, which is mostly sand. So the robot directs its backward camera towards the uh, coral. After a while, it goes back to looking at sand uh, and uh, just to uh, just to see if there is anything uh, worthwhile looking uh, uh, looking at the bottom. And it still figures out that uh, what's the most interesting parts of the scene are on the right. So it rolls itself in order to record useful footage. So you can think of this as sort of a smart camera that follows you around, but also has a 
has some prior knowledge about what you think is interesting so that it can uh, record, you know, uh, it can take uh, scenic pictures along the, uh, along the way. Uh, and when you go to another coral, um, which is on the left, then the robot is going to uh, direct its camera on the, on the left, just like this. And in fact, you can, you can do this not just uh, in the scenario where uh, the robot is following the diver, but the robot can detach from the diver and uh, navigate on its own. So here, for example, the robot is realizing that the diver is going in a direction that is not aligned with the most interesting direction according to the saliency map and then decides to detach. When it navigates autonomously, it relies on this uh, visual navigation uh, view here, which where the, uh, the red column and the green row uh, essentially are categorical distributions over the pitch and the row, uh, the pitch and the yaw of the robot so it avoids uh, obstacles. But it also uses saliency in order to uh, go towards interesting uh, places. So once it figures out that uh, there is a place uh, where saliency is high, such as in this case, uh, it needs a way to notify the, the human, the diver, that it saw something interesting. So it's going to start circ circling around. Uh, and that tells the diver that, uh, hey, you should come check this out. The diver goes uh, and it has to signal to the robot that the, uh, it received the, um, the message, essentially. Uh, so it does, it does that by, he does that by uh, rolling the robot 45 degrees, in which case the robot can continue searching for another, uh, uh, another area. Uh, but let me remind you that communication underwater is very, very difficult, uh, especially doing it uh, with radio, you, you, you can only rely on acoustic communication and that's very expensive. So that's why this interaction here has to be somewhat manual. Um, so that's, that's one way to interact, to specify uh, what you're looking for uh, in terms of useful data. Sometimes you'd like to do that while also imposing some uh, prior over the, or some constraint over, uh, over waypoints. So you'd like to uh, find interesting content like the one in this image, uh, but also stick around these waypoints with some leeway to, to deviate. So how do you do that? Um, so we, we figured out a way to do it using uh, imitation learning for visual data. So um, in order to learn this waypoint conditional uh, visual navigation policies in 3D, we collect a behavior cloning data set uh, from the user. So we present the user an image uh, and the user annotates um, you know, uh, yaw or uh, pitch directions. And with that, we train a behavioral uh, cloning uh, policy, which gets an image and uh, outputs a distribution over the, uh, the pitch and the yaw angles. And in order to make that goal conditional, we do the following. We, we run a state estimation. Uh, so you can think of this as a 3D localization uh, module on the data that the robot collected. And now instead of having a data set of images and commands, we have a data set of images, uh, states, relative uh, positions and orientations, as well as uh, commands that the robot receives. So we can do the same trick that you have in reinforcement learning with uh, hindsight experience replay, which is to treat every state that was vis visited as if it were the goal. And now you have a data, a data set that is that consists of images, relative goals to some initial location, uh, and the commands that the robot would take in order to go there. So you use that data set in order to train a goal conditional policy that depends on the current image, uh, on the desired goal, uh, on the desired relative goal, and on the um, uh, and outputs the you can sample the um, the yaw and pitch in order to get to that destination. So what this looks like is like uh, is as follows, where the robot has to go upwards uh, of this uh, coral in order to get to the goal location. So it does obstacle avoidance and uh, uh, obstacle avoidance in order to reach the goal, but it does it without any specification of where the obstacles are. Uh, it just from the annotations it knows where these images specify a uh, 
uh, an obstacle or not. So in order to better test this, uh, it's very difficult to test this in the field. So we test all of these methods in simulation uh, first and foremost. Uh, and you get these types of behaviors where instead of taking the direct straight line path to from A to B, uh, the robot is going to take the scenic route from A to B in order to uh, see as much coral as possible. So that's how we sort of uh, enable it to deviate from specified waypoints to, uh, to collect useful data on top of corals. So it tries to, to balance you know, distance and uh, relevance of the data it collects. So some other problems in this direction um, are that we need to be able to summarize the videos collected by the robot. So if you worked with robotics, uh, you know that uh, the data sets that they collect are uh, hours long, um, terabytes of, of data uh, after uh, just a few days. Uh, and you cannot expect the scientists to, you know, to scour through all these data, data sets for interesting, uh, for interesting parts. You actually have to figure out ways to summarize all the experience and present the scientists something palatable in which they can say uh, they can know where to focus. So how to summarize these videos and generally data streams is uh, of major uh, concern. Uh, we're also thinking about how to do hierarchical self-supervised representation learning so that we can reason about visual simil similarity at multiple levels of hierarchy, not just at the lowest level. Uh, and we also, uh, we're also looking at uh, essentially how to do active sensing in high dimensional domains where computing the information gain is generally uh, difficult. So that's the, uh, that's the first part uh, of, the, of the talk. If, if you have any questions uh, about any of this, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to move to the second part. All right, so let's talk about uh, let's talk about safety during learning, and how do we get safety guarantees in in RL? Uh, so first of all, why do we need safe exploration in RL for robotics? Uh, is RL even being applied in a, to robotics in a in a way that is uh, that goes outside the lab? Uh, and People are starting to, to do it. Uh, in fact, surprisingly, uh, or perhaps surprising, surprisingly to me, people are uh, starting to apply it uh, on self-driving scenarios as well, which I think is the wrong direction, but people are doing it anyway. So if they are doing it anyway, then perhaps we should consider uh, how to make them, uh, how to make these methods a bit more safe, uh, especially uh, if they are going to, to be uh, trained in the real world. And you also have examples of uh, model-based RL being uh, being used to learn uh, to learn how to fly, for example, from uh, from no experience. So, when applying reinforcement learning to robotics, we need to guarantee that the algorithm will not visit unsafe states very often during learning. So, there has to be some exploration. That there has to there have to be some errors, but we need to uh, help the robot not visit unsafe states very often. And if you ask uh, if you ask control theory people, uh, they're going to tell you that this uh, this problem is easy because unsafe states are fully known. They know which parts of the state space are dangerous, and they just impose constraints to their uh, optimal control problem, so you don't have to visit them. But in the RL community, this is actually hard because they nobody's telling you where the unsafe states are. You have to experience where uh, where dangerous states are in the world. So that's the uh, that's the um, uh, domain where we'll that we'll try to work on. Uh, and in addition, we would like to we would like to have methods that um, guarantee that the learned policy is safe at each iteration, at each policy iteration step, and not just when policy optimization has converged. So I have a question, if possible. Yes. Yeah. So how? How do you define safe states or unsafe states? Is like any formal definition here? I mean, especially when you say that control people, it's easy for them, but for in RL it is not. So maybe it is because the definition of safety is not very clear. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are there are two there are two definitions. First, uh, you can think about unsafe states as states where you're going to incur a very very large penalty, and if you stay in those states, uh, you might risk damage. Uh, second, you might think of uh, lack of safety in terms of lack of stability. Uh, so you, states which are, if you fall in those states, there's no way to recover. Uh, so if you have a robot, uh, uh, this humanoid robot, and it collapses, it falls, there is no way, it's very difficult for this robot to figure out how to get up. Uh, so I think of uh, the trade-offs between, uh, I think of variations of lack of safety uh, between high penalty and uh, lack of recoverability uh, so that you can actually accomplish your objective. Okay, so like, so I guess the second one would be stability. So basically we stay in the region of st uh, attraction yes. of stable thing. Yes. And I guess if you are unstable, then your penalty, I mean, at least most penalties would become unbounded anyway. Yes. Okay, perfect, thanks. So, how, how can we do this? How can we sort of guarantee that, uh, you know, the, our policy updates are safe every time we update the policy? So we can think of this as a constrained MDP formulation where you decouple the task performance, the task value function corresponding to the policy. Uh, and you also have an accident value function, which measures the probability of an accident uh, during learning, and you impose the constraint that the probability of this accident should be upper bounded by some epsilon. Um, and you also have the constraint that your policy uh, at the current uh, optimization step or the, at the current iteration should not deviate too much from the previous policy. So this is, uh, this is a classic type of constraint in uh, model-free uh, RL. Now, the problem is that we actually we're actually quite bad at estimating value functions in a way that uh, uh, we might, in the sense that we might overestimate or underestimate the value function in particular states. Um, so these estimation errors can make the constraint falsely confident. You might think you're satisfying the constraint, but in actuality, you uh, you might you will probably not. So what we want is that uh, we want to ensure that the way we estimate value functions for the uh, for the accident for the probability of an accident is such that it overestimates the true probability of an accident but not by much so we want to um, overestimate the constraint but not by much so that if you upper bound the uh, the overestimate you will definitely upper bound the uh, the true probability of an accident so how do we do this how do we guarantee that a value function provably overestimates or provably underestimates uh, a, uh, the true value function corresponding to the policy. So the key uh, for this was a paper that got published actually last year from Sergey Levin and uh, Abhiral Kumar at Berkeley. Uh, and it's called conservative Q-learning. And the idea here is that instead of only minimizing the standard Bellman error that you might have uh, you might have seen in RL methods. Uh, we also want to you also want to add some uh, terms that essentially minimize large Q values for states and actions that are not in the replay buffer. And R of mu here is a regularization term for how you select for the distribution that selects uh, these um, these actions that are not in the in the replay buffer. Uh, so essentially, the problem here is that uh, you don't want to evaluate, uh, you, do, you don't want to rely on Q values outside the training distribution, outside the replay buffer. You don't want to rely too much on them, and you don't want to allow them to get really uh, high values, uh, because those errors in those types of uh, domains basically uh, propagate through the Bellman iteration. They propagate in the estimation of Q. Uh, and that's what causes misestimation. That's partially what causes misestimation in, in Q functions. So in this conservative Q learning paper, they prove that, um, you know, the estimated Q function with uh, CQL uh, is actually probably an underestimated of the true Q function for every state in the replay buffer and for every action. 
but it turns out that this bound is loose. So they have another version of the uh, uh, of the CQL update rule, which adds a term where you maximize Q values uh, for all the states and actions which are in the replay buffer. Uh, and even though you cannot prove that the Q function is underestimated, you can still prove that the value function is underestimated. And this bound is tighter. So this is the bound that we actually were, uh, use in practice. And also, I want to make the comment that uh, this type of uh, Q learning should probably remind you, uh, in some loose sense, uh, you know, generative models or energy-based models, where you're trying to essentially um, make some uh, make uh, uh, data points in the replay buffer more likely than data points outside the replay buffer, um, while still satisfying the Bellman error uh, or minimizing the Bellman error. So, with that said, how do we compute all of this? There is a min-max objective there. Do you actually have to do min-max optimization, or can you do something else? So it turns out that if you assume that uh, this distribution mu, which selects data points not in the replay buffer, uh, if you assume that this is close to the uniform distribution, you can show that uh, through a maximum entropy type of argument, you can show that uh, the, the max objective can be replaced uh, by, uh, uh, by a log sum x of the, uh, of the, of the Q function. And Essentially, this allows you to uh, to do to, to do to convert this minimax type of problem into just a minimization type of problem with data that you have on the replay buffer uh, only. So this is easy to uh, to compute both for the discrete case and for the continuous case. And this alpha coefficient uh, here uh, allows you to uh, sort of uh, specify the trade-off between treating Q sort of like a generative model and treating, uh, treating Q like uh, the Q function in the, in the Bellman iteration. Okay, so uh, if you plug in the, um, if instead of solving the original uh, constrained MDP, uh, you actually solve the constrained MDP where uh, the probability of an accident has been overestimated here, uh, then, uh, that's the uh, that's sort of the uh, the method that we propose. So it's called const uh, uh, constraint uh, safety critics or conservative safety critics, uh, and um, it actually allows us to um, to bound the probability of an accident in a provable way every at every iteration. And if you if you compare this with existing baselines, uh, the most uh, established of one has been uh, this method called uh, conservative policy optimization from here I, a, a bill a bills group from a few years ago. You will see that we actually managed to uh, to be safer on average uh, than that method. So we have fewer uh, accidents. Uh, in fact, we show that if you you can still do better in terms of uh, the average number of failures and accidents while still not sacrificing a lot of the uh, task performance uh, compared to these other methods. So what, what happened here? Uh, so we're actually managing to, uh, to do well in these environments while better satisfying the constraint. But there is one big catch, and it's an open problem, and we're still working on it. And the problem is that the safety constraint was not always uh, respected in these experiments. So even though we said that the probability of an accident should be uh, less than epsilon, it was actually not respected in practice. And uh, the main reason for that is that the CQL bound, which, assume, which uh, establishes that um, the, the Q function is conservative or the value function is conservative, uh, this bound only holds when, uh, when conservative Q updates converge. So it doesn't hold while you're learning that conservative Q function. And the second reason for this is uh, typical function approximation and sampling errors when you're computing the conservative Q function. So we're actively trying to figure out ways to address this, uh, at least reason uh, issue number one here. 
but it is still ongoing work. So that's the second part of the talk. Uh, and at this point, we're asking what other ways it, and it concerns safety during learning. So at this point, we're asking what other ways are there to think about safety in addition to the const constraint NDP mo uh, model. Um, so we need to consider safety after, uh, after learning. And the main argument here is going to be that we can increase safety by automatically generating adversarial simulation scenarios to expose weaknesses of a policy. Uh, and if you have any questions about any of the uh, uh, work so far, I'll be happy to answer them before I move on to the next part. All right, so adversarial scenarios. So why do we need simulation in the first place? So there was this paper by the Rand Corporation uh, of fame, uh, which, um, which was titled, how many miles of driving would it take to demonstrate autonomous vehicles uh, safety and reliability? Uh, and they argue in this article that uh, even under aggressive te testing assumptions, existing fleets of self-driving cars would take uh, tens and sometimes hundreds of years to drive the required number of miles in order to prove statistically that uh, you know these vehicles are safe. And that's because we're relying essentially on uh, measuring the number of human interventions per mile for all these vehicles that are tested in, uh, in the real world. Um, so this, uh, in my mind, this motivates simulation because we can you can do many more experiments in simulation uh, than uh, trials in the real world, and the repercussions uh, in terms of an accident are much much lower in simulation or close to zero in simulation uh, than in the real world. So how do you generate accidents in simulation? So in fact, we're going to reformulate this question and ask how how can we generate adversarial scenarios in simulation? And most people in um, ML security, when they think about adversarial examples, uh, they think about adding, you know, some noise imperceptible to humans to a classifier so that it can, uh, so the classifier can be confused. And, and there's been this game of cat and mouse uh, generating uh, attacks and defenses in these uh, scenarios, uh, but. Perhaps it's not an exagger exaggeration to say that most ML security papers limit their attention to perturbations and attack models that are you know, bounded by LP norms, uh, and they prove certifiable defenses against these types of attacks. But we, and, and this is an important type of work. You want your uh, cell driving system to be uh, robust to this type of noise. But this is not the only type of noise that would constitute an adversarial scenario. Uh, in fact, this only scratches the surface. So we want to have more semantic uh, adversarial scenarios, plausible scenarios that uh, you know uh, change the structure of the scene uh, and not just add noise to these uh, classifiers or policies. In other words, we want to generate scenarios such as this one, where you have a car basically entering your lane uh, and you see it too late, and then uh, your policy ends up crashing uh, with that car. Um, and we want this so that we can use it in order to ask a human how they would uh, react. So that after training, after asking this human, we could actually uh, choose the, the best possible solution in that case, which is to swerve, perhaps go on the sidewalk if there are no people, and then avoid that car. But we need to include scenarios like this in the training set, and they are, they are typically not in the training set. So if we can generate these dangerous scenarios in simulation automatically, uh, and then ask people to uh, label how they would react to it, uh, we can actually uh, reason about how the vehicle should, uh, should react to it. Um, so what are some of the current approaches, uh, current ways that self-driving companies are thinking about this? Uh, so Waymo, for example, is thinking about this in terms of procedural ge scenario generation uh, plus a real data from uh, that was collected from from these cars, uh, and that's great. Um, Nvidia is thinking about this as procedural scenario generation plus real data 
plus hardware in the loop, uh, where the same exact type of commands would also take into account the hardware of the real car. And that's also great. But the uh, I'm arguing that there are deficiencies in this type of uh, approach. So what's wrong with the procedural generation of uh, simulation scenarios? So if you think about what a simulator is, uh, first of all, it has a physics component, which describes the state transition model. Uh, it has a rendering component, which converts the state, the full state of the system into an observation. And that observation can be an image or a LiDAR point cloud. Uh, this simulator is uh, informed by the geometry of the map. So the meshes of buildings, and it's also uh, informed by the scene properties. So what are the textures? What's the material? What are the masses of different uh, uh, different things in the scene? And what's the behavior of uh, what's the behavior of pedestrians and other cars in the in the scene? So what are their policies? And you also have this self driving controller here, which you you want to test. Um, and you assume that you're given this self driving controller, and this only has um, relies on input. Uh, from observations, whereas all these other policies and other cars, they actually have full state, full knowledge of the state of the system. So you'd like to uh, you'd like to maximize the loss function that describes how badly this self-driving controller does in these simulation scenarios. So you want to push the self-driving controller uh, towards. Uh, you want to show it scenarios where it does pretty badly. So you want to maximize this loss. So how do you do optimization in this case? Uh, well, with procedural generation, uh, first of all, often it is not tailored to the self-driving controller. It is not tailored to the policy. But even if it is, it is usually through a derivative-free way of optimizing for accidents. So essentially, you have this: you have full access to, the, to your simulator, your game engine, but you're treating it as a black box, mostly because you're mostly because of this rendering model here, because you cannot propagate derivatives throughout it. So you can't auto differentiate to compute the derivative of the loss with respect to the map geometry. You cannot compute the derivative of the loss with respect to the scene properties. You cannot compute the derivative of the loss with respect to the behavior of pedestrians and other cars. Uh, so you cannot do many of the useful things that you would expect or you would want to do if you want to optimize this loss function. You're essentially chained and constrained to the to using derivative free optimizers for generating these scenarios so my argument is that we need to have fully differentiable simulators uh, if you want to do this or at least um, we want to be able to handle uh, we, we need to propagate gradients throughout uh, as many parts of this system as we can so how do we reason about differentiable simulation so there is already existing work, but it is separated into two camps. So first of all, um, you have works like recent papers like Diff Tai Chi, uh, which was published at iClear uh, uh, last year, which handles you know deformable objects. But uh, this is purely physics based in the sense that you can measure the states of all these um, uh, all these points that comprise the mesh of these uh, uh, these objects. Uh, and you can control these uh, by assuming that uh, you can take deriv derivatives of the state or the final state with respect to the masses and meshes, uh, mesh properties that generated the desired motion. You also have uh, differentiable renders from the graphics uh, community and the ML community. In fact, at U of T, you have uh, folks like Alec Jacobson and Sanya Fiddler who are uh, actively working on this. Um, but we, but these communities have been traditionally been uh, separate. So what if we consider them jointly? And that's exactly what we did uh, in a recent iClear paper with uh, Sanya, Derek, Liam, and uh, their students, and in particular work by Krishna and Miles here, who really uh, did the heavy lifting on this uh, on this paper. So the main idea here is that you want to combine differentiable physics uh, and rendering engines. So you want to be able to have uh, a computation graph that goes from masses, friction, elasticity properties, and meshes uh, to a physics engine that integrates it over time. 
And here in the middle, you're going to have in physically interpretable states from Lagrangian mechanics or other types of mechanics. Um, and you want to convert these states uh, into uh, a rendering of, uh, of, of those states so that you can have a predicted video. But you can have it in a way that you can take derivatives of all these uh, pixels here with respect to the properties that generated it. Uh, and that means that you can have an L2 loss function between the predicted video and the ground truth video uh, and optimize uh, the system parameters that are going to make the two videos match. And it's worth mentioning that we use the adjoint method here to uh, efficiently compute the gradient of this uh, loss, which allows us to make predictions uh, you know, far away in the future. So we can, we can actually do system identification uh, for rigid bodies where we get a target video uh, and an initial trajectory and we optimize the parameters of the system, the masses of the system, the mass of the system, for example, in order to match, to have the initial video match the, uh, the final video. We can also do this for uh, deformable, uh, deformable objects. Uh, where we're given this time not the video, we're just given a goal image, not the goal configuration of the object, but a goal image. Uh, and we we start from an initial trajectory and uh, optimize the trajectory so that the final frame of that video matches the goal image. Um, we can also do uh, MPC for cloth, for example. So we're given a target image of cloth uh, and we want to optimize the initial trajectory so that it uh, matches at the end the final uh, image. Uh, and I encourage you to look at the paper for more examples of, uh, of this type of uh, control. More recently, uh, in my group, we have tried to extend some of these ideas to, uh, to self-driving simulators. Uh, so Carla is one of the most famous self-driving simulators uh, that is open source. Um, and it has uh, multiple map environments and uh, different cars and different pedestrian behaviors, but it is not, and it relies on the Unreal Engine, but it is not differentiable. So through some of these neural rendering type of approaches, we made it differentiable and so that we can both predict the RGB and the depth uh, of, uh, produced by the simulator. So we actually do this in a way that allows us, oops, we actually do this in a way that allows us to uh, add new objects in the scene. So this cube, for example, didn't exist in the simulator, but we, we can add it. Uh, we can add it through the, through, a neuro, through the neural rendering process. And we, if we can add new objects in the scene, we can also modify uh, objects in the scene. Uh, so that's why this is, uh, this is exciting. So once you, uh, once you're able to have a differentiable renderer like this, uh, you can. We are now in the process of trying to uh, put this in a control loop so that we can um, we can essentially try. We do not need to evaluate the real simulator, but you can evaluate the differentiable simulator instead and have the differentiable simulator improve over time based on queries to the real simulator. Uh, so, but that's still ongoing work. So, where are we heading? towards with this type of uh, project. So we actually want physically realizable adver adversarial attacks, meaning we want to find accidents in simulation uh, and have the simulation in such a way that we can show that if the conditions match, uh, it, the same accident will happen in the real world. Um, in order to do this, we need to be able to simulate based on real data from self-driving data sets, uh, meaning we need to do in-painting and novel view synthesis. Uh, in order to make the data look somewhat more realistic. Uh, and there is a real issue here with handling uh, non-differentiable parts of the self-driving control stack. So not many self-driving companies or any self-driving companies, um, with the exception of NVIDIA, I think, and Wave, are actually using the fully end-to-end -end approach for, for, uh, for driving. Um, so most of them have uh, traditional planners and controls and they separate perception from planning and control. So how do we handle those non-differentiable parts of the self-driving control stack if we want to use derivatives to generate uh, adversarial examples? 
in addition, there is the question of generating rare events itself. Uh, and one way to do that is the using the cross entropy method. Uh, but are there better ways, faster ways to do that, that make use of gradients? And uh, how do we generate diverse adversarial scenarios and rare events uh, for some of these occasions? Uh, and also, how do we reason about the complexity of uh, adversarial scenarios? Since we want to actually transfer these in the real world and implement these environments in the real world, uh, how do we reason about the description length of these scenarios or some other ways to uh, characterize the complexity of these scenarios? So how do we ensure that they are simple? Uh, those are still questions that we're considering, but we, uh, we only have uh, preliminary work to, to show. So that's where I'm going to end. Uh, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, on the top row, all the students who did the heavy lifting for uh, all of these projects. And on the bottom row, all the uh, all the supervisors uh, who um, who basically uh, helped with uh, visioning and ideation and uh, technical details as well. So thanks very much, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Great, thank you very much. It was a very exciting talk. Uh, so if anyone has a question, please go ahead. So maybe uh, I have a question yeah. uh, until others get ready. Uh, so I guess kind of regarding the adversary, like, I mean, the term adversary is very general mm -hmm. and like in say computer vision, when we generate adversarial attacks there are different types of attacks. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, there's a, this kind of chicken and egg problem that these type of robustness methods might be robust to, uh, certain type of adversary, but not others. Mm -hmm. uh, so here, I mean, when you generate adversary using certain type, uh, what is the guarantee that the adversary that happens in real world, like by a human, a bad driver, would be actually any similar to that one? Because the space of all possible adversaries is huge. Yeah. And uh, how do you want to navigate it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and it's the it's the same question that uh, uh, people were asking me in the same in the in a similar talk uh, uh, a few weeks ago about this. Um, but yeah, definitely important question. So, um, first of all, when you when you reason about uh, what rare events to generate, uh, you might want to have priors uh, in addition to having to somewhat limiting the complexity of these. Uh, scenarios. So you want these adversarial scenarios to be simple so that you can transfer them. But you might also want to have priors about what's plausible behavior uh, so that you can select examples that sort of make the best trade off between satisfying your prior and uh, attacking your policy. So the nice thing about some of these, uh, about keeping these attacks, uh, about finding these attacks using gradients is that uh, it, it makes it much easier to uh, reason about uh, priors and have uh, do posterior inference with, when you have access to uh, a fully analytical uh, model and have gradients. Uh, so I, I think I don't have a great way to exactly answer that question, but I think some way to balance a prior of what's a plausible attack and the way of um, basically minimizing the performance of the policy uh, with that attack. I think that's what I'm thinking at the moment. Okay. Like I'm wondering, is it possible, for example, like use accident reports in order to define a kind of initial seed for the ways that accident might happen and then try to kind of find a trajectory of how the normal driving versus accident the driving that led to an accident and then maybe yeah, fill that sure. gap. For sure. So uh, I think you might you might know this, but the uh, there was one company from uh, um, from uh, a spin-off from Oxford actually, uh, which addressed this exact same issue. So they had they were assuming that they had uh, uh, data from 
uh, traffic data uh, and they could uh, use them to create priors of, of what's reasonable driving behavior and how to combine uh, those driving behaviors in order to get an attack at the end. So it also has to do with, uh, you can think about it in terms of uh, uh, macro actions or macro behaviors as well. So if you have a macro behavior such as you know, uh, passing uh, or cutting off, uh, can you sort of combine some of those macro actions in order to get a reasonable behavior, uh, which is composed of, uh, you can get the, uh, a dangerous behavior that is composed of reasonable uh, macro actions. Um, so that's, that's definitely uh, useful as well. Uh, but unfortunately, it's very hard to get uh, access to data for uh, all of these uh, scenarios if you want to you know, actually consult the real world in order to generate them. Okay, thank you. So we have, I guess, Avery has a question. I don't know if Avery wants to. So, okay, maybe I read if Avery is not. Okay, so thanks for the talk. You mentioned finding physically realizable attacks or accidents in simulation and showing it is possible in real life. So for the latter parts, are you referring to recreating the accident during actual driving? Uh, depends, depends what you mean by actual driving. Uh, do I, am I suggesting that actual people should be in those cars? No. Uh, but at the moment, there is some pessimism about the applicability of, uh, of these adversarial attacks because people have not seen any, uh, people have only seen a few examples where these adversarial attacks uh, on policies and not on classifiers uh, transfer to the real world. So many people are asking uh, in the research community, that's that's a nice concept, but if it doesn't transfer to the real world, uh, why is it useful? So in order to uh, even even showing that some of them can transfer, I think that's uh, that's a reasonable step forward. Um, but uh, I am essentially referring to recreating the accident during not actual driving, but driving in a controlled environment. As long as you can map that environment very well and you can simulate it, you can transfer that map into the simulator uh, and be able to control the reasonable variables in the simulator, such as objects that have not been seen in the training set uh, or even control the lighting a bit or control what different uh, posters and signage is showing in that simulator. As long as you can implement all those simple things in the real world, uh, so in the real world, it's going to be difficult to change the lighting, but it might be easier to change uh, signage. So as long as you can do low complexity things like that in order to replicate what the solution that the simulator finds in the real world, uh, I think there's some hope to actually uh, making this work in actual driving in a controlled environment. I'm not suggesting that you should actually do this on the highway. Um, Okay, is there any other question? Okay, seems maybe I ask one quick question and mm. if someone, so on conservative Q learning, so that mu parameter, uh, was it the policy, right? So that wasn't the distribution of our state actions was just con policy essentially. It wasn't the policy. It was the it was the distribution that suggests uh, out of distribution samples uh, that have the uh, out of distribution actions uh, on states that you have already observed in the replay buffer. Right, right. I mean, uh, by policy, I meant that it is a distribution of our actions and not right, right. other yeah. state actions. Yeah, okay. yeah. And then, but the I guess the first and the distribution of our states was from D, which is the replay buffer, right? Right, right. Yeah. Okay, so essentially it doesn't uh, penalize for things that are outside distribution of our states, but only of our actions. So it's kind of like robust, maybe in some sense. I don't still understand it, but it might yeah. be only robust for the training sets, not uh, right, outside right. training sets. Right, so I think you can also modify it so that it's robust with respect to states, unseen states as well. So that it can select, it can propose in addition to proposing uh, uh, 
unseen actions for seen states to propose unseen states and actions. I think you can modify the proofs okay. so that that's valid as well. Okay, because when you mentioned that, like during training, if I recall correctly, some of the constraints were actually violated the, in the constraint MDP framework. Correct, correct. Uh, and is it because violated because the new data set that arrived, uh, it wasn't actually trained on it, or it was because, as you mentioned, it was that queue hasn't yet converged or that kind of optimization hasn't converged yet? Uh, the major reason is that it hasn't converged yet. Okay. So in some okay. sense, you need to collect, you need to collect more experience and wait for longer in order for that uh, conservative queue to converge before you update your policy. So that's okay. the that's the that's the conundrum and the trade-off there. So you need to find a way to guarantee that before you update your policy, your conservative queue function that imposes the constraint has converged, and not. Uh, not do this dual optimization while the conservative queue learning is is still uh, converting. Okay, thanks. Um, do we have any other question or if not? Um, okay, Mah Parsa, do you want to say your ask your question? Yes, hi. Sure. Uh, hi. Actually, this question is related to the first part of your talk. Uh, it seems to me that the time lag and embedding dimension can affect the number of clusters. If so, is there any approach to choose the optimal values of these factors? Uh, when you when you say time lag, what do you mean? Uh, the capital T in the first part of your oh, I see. talk. I see. Yeah. Uh, I see. Uh, so we do that. So first of all, we do that offline, uh, meaning we assume that we have a data set of videos and we use that to extract representations. Um, so in that sense, the time lag uh, just gives us more opportunities to see the same part of the scene from different viewpoints, as long as the robot is moving. Uh, with respect, so can that affect the number of uh, clusters? Um, I would say no. Uh, yeah, I don't see at the moment how that would affect the number of uh, clusters, but the embedding dimension for sure. And uh, regarding the second part of your question, is there approach to choose uh, optimal values of, of these factors? Uh, for the embedding dimension, uh, there are a few, uh, a few techniques that with which you could measure uh, proxies uh, of how good your clustering is, uh, but uh, we haven't we haven't looked at them. Uh, we haven't we are not considering them at the moment. But it would be interesting. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you, everyone, and thanks, uh, Florian, for the great talk. Uh, I think I enjoyed it very much, and I. I believe others have to. Uh, yeah, okay, so let's thank Florian again and uh, I hope you all have a good day. Thanks very much and feel free to reach out with questions after the after the talk, happy to chat. Bye-bye. Sure.